If I have time, one of Tsongkhapa's big critiques is that you cannot arrive at enlightenment without a good start. Don't throw out your conceptual knowledge. Don't, don't throw out your ability to reason your way to enlightenment. Go back for a second, if you will, to the image of meditation in our culture. What does it look like? It's a beautiful bikini, and it's a great setting, and sun is setting, and it's full lotus. But she's also closing her eyes, and she? she's in samadhi. She's in bliss. And there's this idea that in that state of bliss, there's also the absence of what? I didn't think about that. There's the absence of thoughts. If you go out in the street, many of you are yoga teachers and meditation teachers and therapists, you teach mindfulness, you know mindfulness. The popular kind of view of meditation is that it is thoughtless. It's about clearing your mind. It's about postponing your thoughts. It's about getting between the thoughts. Suspending thoughts. Emptying your mind. And according to the Galukpa approach that is central and articulated by Tsongkhapa, one of his main critiques is that you need good, critical understanding as your basis. Through, a, through hearing and listening, and di better understanding is arrived by con a better conceptual understanding. You need that. You need classes where you're trained in view. If you go out into a hermitage too early with no training and try to discover view, there is the occasional spontaneous enlightenment that may happen to a protege. Like Krishnamurti in his autobiographies, he was very young and walking on the beach in Maharashtra somewhere, and he, boom, had a samadhi and a deep recognition of the nature of reality. It happens. But it happens so rarely. What happened with Tsongkhapa in his later reformation is that he devised a curriculum where a vast majority of people could replicate the experience by way of a heavy set training. And it involved and was critically hinged upon people having a firm conceptual understanding that they then debated and, and, um, and refined through reflection. And then they went to meditate on it. And so if you look at the history of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, it, it starts around the 8th century with Shankarakshita and Kamala Shila and Padmasambhava. And there is a series of great debates at the outset of the transmission of Buddhism to Tibet. And the kings, Tritsun Detsen at the time, was pat uh, patronizing and organizing a set of very intensive debates that uh, some of the scholar scholarly literature says it lasted three years. A long debate between the uh, China East Asian school by, with a proponent named Moyen and Kamala Shila from India. So they bring, at the time, they bring the, the chief exponent, the greatest scholar from each of these uh, opposing schools. India comes the gradual path, the gradual approach. And from China, East Asia, comes this spontaneous enlightenment tradition. And you're all familiar with what they were saying. We're basically saying, and it's, in a way, it's kind of true. Listen to it. It says that ultimate reality cannot be achieved by way of conceptuality. The, the final breakthrough is non-conceptual. Does that make sense to you? Mm, yeah. We all would all agree with it. But how does one arrive there. So the proponents of the East Co Eastern schools are basically saying that your training should be one of non-conceptuality non, uh, non at the very beginning. Don't worry about your scholarship. Just meditate. And what do you meditate on? Empty, em, meditate on no mind. Don't entertain conceptual thoughts. Buddha nature is right there. It's immediate. Enlightenment is right there. It's very present. Just don't think about it. 
In other words, your thoughts themselves are obscurations or uh, uh, hindrances to the achievement of the awakening that's already uh, uh, available. And you can't argue with that. But Tsongkhapa does argue with it. And I'm just presenting this because so you know the the point of view that he's taking and the justification and the rational is, and as a result of that rationalization, the tradition that he that that is born from him. And it's not to say that the others are wrong, it's just to say what he was saying is the possible pitfalls of suspending all these other trainings and going for no mind is that you can linger in a kind of numbness. You can linger in the numbness on, in Costa Rica thinking that you're having a breakthrough. Breathing in and breathing out. How many of us have been on a nice retreat where you're breathing in and breathing out? Maybe you're not in your bikini, but you're breathing in, <laughs> breathing out. Okay, but let's say you have, um, let's say you have racism in your heart. Maybe let's say you have bigotry in your heart. Let's say you have some perspective about reality in your heart. But then you go on one of these breathing out and breathing in meditations. And what do you feel when you're breathing in and breathing out of around the third or fourth or fifth day? And it becomes very, it takes a life of its own. You go into the flow. And are you thinking about your dinner and your breakfast and your boyfriend and your girlfriend in the flow? No, you're in the flow, which means subject and object, what happens to them in the flow? Subject and object collapse. So what's the subject and the object? The subject is you thinking, and the object is that which you're thinking of. In the flow, there's no subject and object. So Nkapa says that can be a mistaken enlightenment. And not only can it be a mistaken enlightenment, but it gives a false sense of security that you have arrived at a hallmark where really you have taken a vacation and the imprints, the vasanas, the samskars, the karmas, the bigotry and the hatred and the attachment and the fixation, they have just temporarily been suspended. So what happens when you come home from Costa Rica? What happens when you get off your meditation cushion? What happens when you are out of the flow? Boom. All your mistaken views have, are reactivated. One of, one of the reasons I think it's important to study the biography of Tsongkhapa and to make this jump through history to its relevance is I think in our contemporary times we see two hallmarks that Tsongkhapa was facing. One is a preponderance of mistaken view and the other one is the degradation of ethics. I think what we're facing on the planet, every pitfall that we can see, every shortcoming that we can see, every unbelievable obstacle that comes across the news and terrifies us about where we are in the planet, the fires in Australia, the uprisings, the, uh, the insurgents, the mass migrations, the banking cartels, the lack of uh, justice, if you look at them carefully and parse them out, they are coming from mistaken views. And one of the, one of the big mistaken views that influences each and every one of them is something very deadly called nihilism. Nihilism essentially is suggesting that nothing really exists and therefore nothing really matters. And therefore, let yourself be assailed by your greed and your avarice and your hatred. Get yours now. And don't worry about anyone else. Or if they get in your way, you have some sort of obligation to destroy them. Just, just have a think about it and start thinking about all the problems that we're facing right now. If we do not address the underlying view that bears them, then what we'll be doing is we'll just be trying to um, bully or police people to stop certain actions. We might as well send them on a temporary meditation journey in Costa Rica. 
because at some point they're come home from the journey and their bigotry and their hatred and their greed and their sense that nothing matters and the sense of their desperation of let me get mine now and let me, let me cut the horns off the last rhino on the planet will still be intact. So it's not just view at the time there was this prevalent kind of emergen that stems back from these great debates at the outset of the introduction of Buddhism to Tibet. At that point, Kamala Shila was made the victor and the gradual path took, took its stronghold. And the gradual path continues for a long time, but then there's a degradation to the Dharma and there's a resurgence in this kind of lazy attitude about the quest for perfect view. And with it, there's also a lazy attitude about virtue and ethics. Because they come together, view and ethics, they come together. They, as I mentioned, you cannot have perfect view without, without virtue. Like, think about it, those of us that have taken the precepts, when you go to a monastery or you do a 10-day <coughs> Vipassana course or you take refuge, you are taking a series of ethical uh, recommendations to heart. Those ethical recommendations are do's and do nots that curtail your instincts and protect your mind from the result of those instincts. And as long as you abide by them, something happens in your mind. When you go to the monastery, you take five precepts, you take five precepts for 10 days or one month retreat. Something happens to your mind, some stability is achieved because you're saying, I can't do certain things that would aggravate and afflict my mind, right? Like if I'm allowed to like be nasty and unkind and, and greedy and, and hurtful, it's not like you do those things and they have no repercussions on your mind. Never mind the repercussions on others. So when you say I'm going to restrain those for a period of time, they have a natural tendency to calm the mind. Is that the end result to calm the mind? No, the end result then is to use that stability of mind for what? For a deep analytical reflection. If your quest is to see the nature of reality, now you see that first you, you subdue your instincts so that you can gain facility or faculty of mind so that that can be applied to a deep critical introspection so that that can lead to a deeper intuitive understanding. That's the Lam Rim. That's the process. That's the gradual path training. That's how virtue, meditation, and wisdom all have to be present. That's why it's so important to take refuge. That's why it's so important to keep your vows. And then you also have to learn something. Most people just go on retreat. Meditation in our culture is the only game in town. It's not a bad game. It's just not, it's not, the, game, it's not the game for enlightenment. I think maybe that's probably the problem, is we don't believe in enlightenment. We only believe in stress reduction. So then it's okay. Everybody loves mindfulness because it does its job if the point is stress reduction. And we've got 8 billion people that are really stressed out right now. So I'm not, I'm not going to be here saying don't practice mindfulness. But also don't confuse it with what the tradition was trying to do. The tradition set itself up to liberate human beings, complete liberation. I think probably we could debate for months if you actually, as practitioners sitting in this room doing a program like this, fully committed to your studies, if you believe that liberation is possible. I mean, that's a worthwhile reflection. Jay.